spacious and comfortable interior, state-of-the-art safety features, and adventure-ready design. Whether you're traveling near or far, you'll enjoy the journey. Thanks to our friends at McGrath Evanston Subaru. Don't miss your chance. Enter at WTTW.com slash sweepstakes for your chance to win. Programming on WTTW is made possible in part by viewers like you and by the following. In 1945, Walter Smith Sr. opened a family business in his name. Four generations in, and the Smith family remains committed to the ideals he set forth. Offer furniture for all Chicagoans, including a variety of styles and price points, and provide service to all who enter our doors, including in-store and in-home design assistance. We look forward to welcoming you into the Smith family, just as we have since 1945. WTTW programming originates from the Renee Crown Public Media Center. WTTW shares our gratitude with Alexandra and John Nichols for their leadership commitment to trusted news and public affairs programming. PBS is proud to bring you Freedom Songs, the music of the Civil Rights Movement. a window into the musical and lyrical soul of the times and of the men and women that use music to give them the strength and solidarity to stand up for justice. Join us for a look into this crucial part of American history. Friday at 8 on WTTW. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Gail. And we're at the Chicago Botanic Garden. And you're watching WTTW Chicago. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Amanda Vinicky. Brindis Friedman is on assignment on the show tonight. We are committed to the safe evacuation of as many people as quickly and as safely as possible. One year since the Taliban seized Afghanistan's capital following the removal of U.S. troops, how are refugees adapting to life in America? The reemergence of polio in New York and internationally is causing concern. An infectious disease specialist on what you should know. We still were in fear every day following the situation. Local Amazon workers say the company didn't properly address racist death threats and punished employees when they spoke out. I can tell them, be honest with the people. They should tell us, okay, when you're going to close the store. Two years later, and vendors are still wondering if the new owner of the Discount Mall in Little Village will keep its doors open. Another two stores exit the Magnificent Mile. That and more business news from Cranes. Ten years ago today, applications for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, also known as DACA, were accepted for the first time. So my dad looked at me, and he said, son, we did it. We did it. And hear about the journey of Indiana's only Latino State House member. But first, some of today's top stories. Jury selection begins in the trial of Chicago born R&B star R. Kelly. This is Robert Kelly's second trial on federal charges that he allegedly filmed sex acts with underage girls and conspired to fix his child pornography trial in 2008. Kelly's defense attorney, Jennifer Bonjean, failed to convince the judge that any prospective juror who had seen the explosive Surviving R. Kelly documentary should be excluded. Kelly was recently sentenced to 30 years in prison in his federal racketeering and sex trafficking case in New York and is in federal custody. He's appealing that ruling. The dozen jurors plus six alternates are expected to be seated by tomorrow. The trial is expected to last a month. Another violent weekend in Chicago. 44 people were shot and eight killed in shootings across the city. But police brass say this weekend saw less violence than last year. Because of the tireless efforts of our officers and involved community and city partners, Chicago continues to see declines in homicides and shootings. So far for the month of August, we're down 30% in homicides compared to the same time in August of 2021. 
The Highland Park City Council this evening approved a resolution that recommends banning weapons of war in the United States. It's in reaction to the 4th of July parade mass shooting where seven people were killed and dozens injured. The resolution calls for action at the state and federal level and recommends banning the manufacture, purchase, sale, possession and use of all semi-automatic weapons, high capacity ammunition magazines and body armor with exceptions for the military and law enforcement. Highland Park Mayor Nancy Rotary says it's necessary for public safety. She says mass shootings are uniquely American, but that Highland Park is not an island. Up next, the one-year anniversary of the U.S. military's withdrawal from Afghanistan. So stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. One year ago today, the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan following the chaotic withdrawal of remaining U.S. troops and personnel there. In that time, around 1,500 refugees have settled in Illinois while their home country has seen poverty, food insecurity, and human rights erode under an oppressive ruling regime. What is the future of that country and what is life like here for the new arrivals? Joining us with more on all of that are Abu Bakr Maya, immigration attorney at Refugee One. Austin Wright, Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and Lisa Wilson, Executive Director of the East Central Illinois Refugee Mutual Assistance Center. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. Austin Wright, one year of Taliban rule in Kabul in Afghanistan. What has that country been like? What is life in that country like? Well, I think since the uh, consolidation of authority under the Taliban, there's been a significant shift in local economic conditions. Uh, as well as a shift in health conditions. As you highlighted, one of the greatest challenges they faced in the first six months was tremendous food insecurity. Um, and in the last six months, there's been a significant shift in local resilience and rural livelihoods that I think will continue to attract attention. But in effectively all cases, what we've seen is an eroding both of local security, and that's both physical and food security, uh, as well as local economic conditions. And, and we know that the, the U.S. you know withdrew all troops and all personnel. Is there any Western assistance uh, uh, to to the residents of that country to deal with some of these problems? There is some, uh, both direct and indirect assistance uh, from the West. I think that there uh, are plans in the works now to attempt to expand that assistance. Uh, especially given what we have seen in the past 12 months. Um, but how effective those programs are and the, ex to, the extent to which they will be welcomed by the regime uh, is yet to be seen. Lisa Wilson, give us a sense of how many refugees have, have arrived in Illinois and what their life has been like since they've gotten here. Well, in, um, here in East Central Illinois, I'm in, uh, I'm in Champaign, Illinois, we've received about 70 Afghan evacuees. I believe the number is, is uh, much, much higher in the Chicago area. But locally, we've received uh, a good number of refugees here in Champaign-Urbana. And, what is and their, life, what is, how, have they, how have they adapted to life there? Um, they are adjusting. It's been um, a pretty difficult adjustment. We were first faced with... Um, the struggle of trying to find them housing. Um, another struggle was getting um, documentation so that they could work. Um, then we had to find jobs and um, try and give them enough uh, assistance, direct assistance in terms of rental, utility, and food assistance in order to um, have them survive. And uh, Abu Bakr, Maya, how about here in the Chicago area? How many refugees have arrived here and what have been the biggest challenges uh, to, to adapting to their life here? Well, we uh, at Refugee One, we're one of the largest uh, resettlement agencies um, in, the, in the Chicagoland area, for sure. So we have around 400 Afghan families. Uh, one of the biggest trials and tribulations that we're facing with these refugees is that uh, many of them don't speak the language. Uh, they have uh, basically little to no, no education. Some of them are actually indigenous uh, with, 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 with the literacy. Um, so these are the caveats that they're facing. And um, keep also in mind that Afghanistan had 43 years of war. I mean, you know, 20 of it was uh, was, was uh, during this war on terror. And uh, we have generation generation of people who have witnessed nothing but war. And as they're coming here into society, 
Uh, many of them are having PTSD, we're noticing. You know, this is also leading to uh, many people that have domestic uh, abuse within the household. And uh, this is all because of uh, what they've experienced in Afghanistan. So there's a, there is that assimilation uh, difficulties that uh, many of these clients are currently facing. And Austin, right, we talked about the refugees that have arrived here, but how many U.S. Uh, or Afghan allies, uh, interpreters still remain in Afghanistan, and how difficult has it been to get some kind of asylum or refugee status in the United States for them? Well, I think it's it's difficult to know the exact number that remain, but, you know, one thing that was clear uh, as the drawdown was coming to a close and the Taliban were surging towards Kabul is that the wait list was more than a year long. In some cases, individuals are waiting uh, past two years in order to complete their paperwork, um, all of which was in violation of, of the relevant statutes. Uh, and so, you know, I think, you know, one of the key things to take away is, is it's still difficult to know how many have been left behind. A number have effectively given up on the process. Um, and I think that this really is, is, is a serious consideration for the United States and future conflicts uh, as it attempts to, to rebuild a reputation for protecting local assets during an ongoing conflict and after they've ended their military operations. So certainly to build that kind of trust. Abu Bakr Maya, being an immigration attorney, what are the legal routes to challenge uh, the administration to, to speed up this process to get more of these allies into the United States? Uh, unfortunately, for immigration matters, you know, the, you know, on one end, we want family reunification. On the other hand, we don't want immigrants at the same time. So it's this dichotomy between immigration law. Uh, and it seems like nothing has been more true than uh, when it came to dealing with the Afghans. Um, it, you know, they have the Adjustment Act, the Afghan Adjustment Act. I mean, that is right now has passed through. Uh, the House and I believe it's uh, and the Senate and whatnot, but you know, practicality. We don't know how when that's going to come about. Uh, right now, the only uh, form of relief, uh, because the one-year deadline is approaching um, for many of these uh, evacuees who are entering in the United States, is asylum. Um, obviously, there are certain conditions and whatnot. Uh, the base, the well-founded fear element, uh, based off the characteristics of race, religion nationality, member of a particular social group or political opinion. Uh, but if you don't meet those characteristics, I don't know what grounds you're gonna file for asylum. So th there, there are only certain elements uh, and forms of relief that we can, we can uh, really apply for. But like I said, until the uh, Afghan Adjustment Act uh, doesn't really, you know, practically gets implemented, there's not really much other than just being on this humanitarian parole that they're currently on. So, so a lot of challenges remain. Lisa Wilson, I interviewed a few uh, recent uh, Afghan student arrivals here. Uh, Northeastern Illinois has a program where they're offering scholarships. And, you know, the, the one thing they told me uh, about was their worry about their family back home. What do the families uh, in uh, central Illinois tell you about uh, the situation that their loved ones are facing back home? Um, they are very worried, very concerned. Uh, we have one client in particular who is, um, uh, has some serious health challenges and he is desperate to have his family join him. And unfortunately, I do not have a good answer for him because as of right now, we know of no way to reunify these families. We can submit all their names and documentation, but until we find out how they're going to physically get them out of Afghanistan and to the United States, I'm afraid I don't have much good news for our clients. Austin Wright, when you look back on the withdrawal one year later and you think about just how off guard the U.S. Uh, seemed to be caught with the speed at which uh, the Taliban took Kabul, retained power, um, what have we learned a year later about what went wrong and why? Uh, I think that we've, we've learned a lot. I think there are still a lot of, quite a few lessons uh, left to be learned. You know, one is that the, the U.S. attempt to get a, a relatively swift victory uh, before the 2020 presidential election in the form of a settled peace deal with the Taliban uh, effectively ceded too much ground. Uh, it undermined the legitimacy of the Ghani administration. And you're talking and, about the like, Trump-Pompeo deal uh, with, with right. the Taliban, which basically left out the, the provisional government there. Exactly. So it left out the democratically elected government um, in favor of a deal that would include only effectively two partners. Um, and, and this ceded ground, strategic ground, that in the end did exactly what the Taliban had intended, which is to undermine the legitimacy of the elected government. Um, when, those, when the deal uh, effectively broke, the secret was out. It undermined public confidence uh, in the Ghani administration, 
it undermined uh, any confidence that civilians had in the staying power of, of U.S. support for anything short of a power sharing a government. Um, and, and in the end created the sort of fertile ground uh, for mobilization of civilians who might otherwise have been on the edge uh, to, uh, to support the Taliban as they swiftly took over Kabul. All right. Well, a, a lot to, to think about one year later. Uh, a lot of strife facing uh, folks in Afghanistan and those trying to get to the U.S. And our thanks to Abu Bakr Maya, Austin Wright, and Lisa Wilson. Thank you so much. Thank you. And another anniversary. Ten years ago today, the first applications for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or commonly known as DACA, were accepted. It granted temporary residency status for undocumented immigrants brought here as children. But DACA hasn't completely erased their worries. The program narrowly survived a host of legal challenges, with the latest case putting the program in jeopardy once again. And joining us to talk about all this are Irma Wilson, staff attorney with the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic, Fred Sow, senior policy counsel with the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and Dulce Dominguez, DACA recipient and immigrant rights advocate. We welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. Fred Sow, the Trump administration tried to get rid of DACA. The Supreme Court in 2017 overruled that, kept the program around, but there have been legal challenges since. Remind us the legal status of DACA as we speak now. Okay. Thank you, Paris. Uh, the DACA program is still alive, uh, though only for those people who had DACA. Um, you know, those individuals are still able to continue with their DACA and to renew their DACA. Unfortunately, though, um, the you know no new DACA applications are being accepted or processed, and this is uh, as a result of a court ruling in Texas uh, last year uh, in a case brought by Texas and several other uh, states that challenged uh, whether the Obama administration acted properly to create the program to begin with. So, uh, and that that case is now winding its way through the courts. Um, in the meantime though DACA is still there, but only for those people who already had it. Irma Wilson, how, much, uh, how many people does this impact, the, the notion that, that new uh, applicants cannot uh, apply for DACA and get acceptance? Um, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands. Here in Illinois, we have 40,000 current DACA recipients and almost 800,000 renewal DACA applicants throughout the nation, and this affecting everyone in every state. And what is your legal advice uh, to those uh, that are trying to gain DACA status that uh, just can't right now because this is tangled up in the courts? At this point, just hold off, but definitely get a legal screening to see if there's other remedies, immigration benefits that you may qualify for, um, and make sure your paperwork is in order in case there's something that comes up soon. Mm -hmm. Dulce Dominguez, uh, you are a DACA recipient and an immigration rights advocate. What has your experience been like over the last 10 years? So it's been a roller coaster of emotions. Uh, my family arrived here and um, when I was about two years old. We've been here now for about 26 years. Um, you know, throughout my life, I think I've had a lot of instability, inconsistency, uh, and it's just been very hard to plan a life um, in two year increments. Um, while I acknowledge that DACA has been a life-changing opportunity, I think it's also, you know, time to reflect on the last 10 years and, and how this policy should really be, be seen as a failure of our government system. And, and Dulce, you're saying two-year increments, but as I understand, uh, since one of the latest court rulings, uh, do DACA recipients need to reapply every year now? I, not, that, not that I know of every year. Um, it almost feels like every year and a half you're planning out, even though it's two years. Uh, by like a year and six months, I'm already thinking about having to get that money in order, having to get my paperwork in order to make sure that I get my paperwork back in time to still be um, in accordance with the policy. Fred, so tell us about that, the reapplication process and how stressful that can be. Well, um, every single application, you have to come up with $495. Um, if there's any updated information, you have to compile all of that. Um, you know, by now, uh, many of the people who have DACA have gotten pretty good at it. That said, it's still a cost. And, um, you know, people with DACA have to figure out, okay, how, how am I going to set aside the money to, you know, pay for this additional fee, um, you know, every two years, as Dulce described. 
Irma Wilson, since the program began 10 years ago, how many in the Chicago area has it impact and, impacted and what has it meant for their lives? It's about 42,000 in the whole state of Illinois. Um, it changes your whole life. I'm a former DACA recipient and it opens every opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. Having legal status even for that two years means being able to work legally, being able to get a driver's license and be able to lo not live in fear anymore. Mm -hmm. So it impacts, you know, mental health. It impacts your financial status, your, your whole family's life. Mm -hmm. Dulce Dominguez, aside from the stress of reapplying every two years or so, uh, have you felt that? Have you felt opportunities open up to you over the last 10 years? Yes, um, I think without that guy, I would not have been able to pursue um, an education. It came at such a critical moment in my life. I was 18, had just graduated from high school. I was, you know, looking for the next steps. Uh, thanks to DACA, I was able to, you know, work my way through college, uh, find my way to a social work career, uh, find job opportunities that provided me access to health care, um, you know, a decent living. I think without having, uh, you know, this, this work permit, I would not have access to any of that. Mm -hmm. and, and Fred Sow, obviously a more permanent solution would be Congress uh, passing a law and the president signing it. Senator Durbin uh, has been instrumental in trying to get the DREAM Act passed for many years. He said recently on this show that he, he might be able to get it called up for a vote sometime soon again. How realistic are the prospects for a DREAM Act or some kind of legislative solution? Well, um, Senator Durbin has been working on the DREAM Act for 21 years. Um, and uh, we did come close uh, back in 2010. Uh, unfortunately, the, the bill fell just a few votes short. Uh, Congress did consider a version of the DREAM Act last fall as part of Build Back Better. Unfortunately, that did not stick. Um, there is massive bipartisan support um, you know, among both parties. Uh, for, the, for, the, for some version of the DREAM Act. You would think this would be a no-brainer. Um, it's, it's just a matter of political will. And Irma Wilson, short of this, what is the future of DACA? It's still, it's still undecided. The courts, the, there's still undecided court decisions out there. So we just encourage people to renew their DACA if they have current status mm -hmm. um, and hold off for anything else. Dulce Dominguez, short of a legislative solution, uh, will DACA recipients always kind of live with this anxiety that this, this protected status might go away? Yes, I think especially over the last six to seven years, we've just lived in so much uncertainty. Um, and I think many of us are just looking forward to the day that we can start planning a, a long-term vision for our future. All right, uh, 10 years on since the first uh, DACA recipient uh, applied and, and received their uh, temporary status here in the United States and a lot to iron out still. Our thanks to Irma Wilson, Fred Sow, and Dulce Dominguez. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, accusations of a racially hostile work environment at a Chicago area warehouse. So please stay with us. We've made it. Justice Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court provides a beacon of hope. Black women are underrepresented. We still rise. We still show up for one another. It's us investing in the next generation and giving them something to enrich the next generation with. Late last month, 26 current and former employees of a Joliet Amazon warehouse accused the company of allowing a racially hostile work environment. They've since been joined by a dozen more workers who've filed charges with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The charges outline racist death threats against black employees, threats that came just days after the grocery store mass shooting in Buffalo that is believed to have targeted black residents. As Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, some of those employees also say they faced retaliation from Amazon since speaking out. We were put in a predicament where we still were in fear every day following the situation. On May 25th, employees at Amazon's MDW2 distribution warehouse in Joliet say they found graffiti threatening the lives of black workers. We were told that we could go home and uh, with no pay or we could stay there and keep working. Workers say Amazon didn't send a message to employees until nearly 24 hours after the threat was found. 
And Tori Davis says she was fired after talking with co-workers and demanding action from management. We're not going away until they take this seriously. Attorney Tamara Holder represents the workers in their complaint to the EEOC and says the graffiti was not the first instance of discrimination. Men wearing Confederate flag outfits in the workplace with impunity. Complaints uh, about from workers about other workers using the N-word with impunity. An Amazon spokesperson tells WTTW News, Amazon works hard to protect our employees from any form of discrimination and to provide an environment where employees feel safe. Hate or racism have no place in our society and are certainly not tolerated by Amazon. Holder also says Amazon has threatened and fired workers who have spoken out, saying they violated a confidentiality agreement they signed upon hiring. The contract is written for somebody who would have trade secrets. This confidentiality agreement was not made for low-wage warehouse workers, but I believe it's a tool to silence those workers. Nicole Porter is a professor at Chicago Kent College of Law. She says confidentiality agreements are a way for companies to protect their trade secrets from competitors. You know, special procedures that have turned out to be very efficient and effective for us. You're not allowed to talk about any of that. All right. You know, lots of employers do have employees sign confidentiality agreements. That's actually quite common. But Porter says they can't be used to stop employees from speaking out about their workplace. As for the EEOC charges, among other things, the plaintiffs have to prove the racism was pervasive, unwelcome, and that the company failed to act, but it could be a long legal road ahead. The EEOC has the opportunity uh, to investigate, and something I think like this, where it's several plaintiffs complaining about it, the EEOC will take that more seriously than they might just like one individual um, employee. Uh, bringing a claim. The EEOC might file a lawsuit, call for mediation, or leave it to the plaintiffs to sue. As for the threats workers say they've faced for speaking out. The employer cannot retaliate against any of the employees that filed a charge simply because they filed a charge. Now proving that causation piece is sometimes difficult. Workers want to do this work. They want a, a good paying job. They want to get home safely at the end of the day. But we need to see some accountability from these companies. Warehouse Workers for Justice is a nonprofit workers center in Will County. After the death threats, they worked with Amazon employees to publicize the incident and bring their concerns to management. But really talking to, to more workers at MDW2, you know, just discovering sort of a whole host of health and safety issues, you know, workers, um, workers had concerns about. Um, and um, what workers felt was inadequate pay. Given the explosion of Amazon facilities and other warehouses in recent years, Marco Senicero says his organization has a lot to tackle. Warehousing is the number one employer in the region, but what, what we see is that um, what does not get better is the work, are the working conditions of these workers. In fact, they're getting worse. It's important for us to do this work. As for the EEOC charges, Tamara Holder says, We are going to continue to gather as much information as it takes to make sure that Amazon listens to us and fixes this work environment. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. An Amazon spokesperson did not respond to follow-up questions about worker claims of retaliation or the company's confidentiality agreement. Now, Paris, we toss it back to you. All right, Amanda, thanks. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, a proposal for the first multi-home development in Chicago made from shipping containers. That and more business news from Cranes. Vendors at Discount Mall in Little Village say the shopping center's contract expires soon and they don't know the developer's plans. Polio eradication was considered one of the country's greatest public health victories. So why are we seeing a reemergence? And Indiana's only Latino state house member on his journey to the legislature and his hopes for the community. But first, some more of today's top stories. Jury selection begins in the trial of Chicago-born R&B star R. Kelly. This is Robert Kelly's second trial on federal charges that he allegedly filmed sex acts with underage girls and conspired to fix his child pornography trial in 2008. Kelly's defense attorney, Jennifer Bonjan, failed to convince the judge that any prospective juror who had seen the explosive Surviving R. Kelly documentary should be excluded.
Kelly was recently sentenced to 30 years in prison in his federal racketeering and sex trafficking case in New York and is in federal custody. He is appealing that ruling. The dozen jurors plus six alternates are expected to be seated by tomorrow. The trial is expected to last about a month. Former Governor Pat Quinn demands Mayor Lori Lightfoot release a watchdog report of the 2020 Little Village smokestack implosion. Details of the city inspector general's investigation into a former coal plant's smokestack implosion have not been made public. City officials have said that by law they cannot release the full report. But Quinn, who is considering running for mayor himself, disputes that and says the city should bring back the Department of Environment. According to a summary of the report released in January, no city employees were fired for allowing the environmental disaster, but one public health official received a written reprimand. It's hard to believe, but it's already back to school for some Illinois kids. Classes begin Tuesday for students in the state's second largest school district. U46 includes 11 northwest suburban communities, including Elgin, Schaumburg, St. Charles, and Bartlett. More than 37,000 students will be back at U46 as schools statewide struggle with a teacher and bus drive shortage right now. Chicago Public Schools is set to begin the new school year next week. And the Chicago Sky have secured home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. The defending WNBA champions beat the Phoenix Mercury yesterday for a franchise record 26 win this season. The number two seed Sky will face the number seven seed New York Liberty Wednesday night at Wintrust Arena. The first two games of the first round will be at home and then game three will be in New York if necessary in the best of three series. Chicago has clinched playoff berths for four consecutive seasons under coach James Wade. And now back to Amanda for some of today's top business headlines. Amanda. Thanks, Paris. The Magnificent Mile gets hit with another couple losses, but there's a glimmer and a shimmer of hope for the city's premier shopping strip, plus a proposal for Chicago's first development of multiple homes made of shipping containers and a new ice cream bar that hopes to take you to the bar. Here to go behind the headlines is Crane's Chicago business editor and wire. And Crane's support is reporting that the Mag Mile losing two stores but gaining a new one. What are they and what does that mean for the Mag Mile? Is it still magnificent? Well, I think it's still magnificent, uh, but I will say that uh, there is a mixed, uh, a mix of good and bad news here, unfortunately. Swarovski is on the, the good side of the ledger. They're returning to the Mag Mile after closing two stores there uh, in past years. They're going into 630 North Michigan, which was uh, in a space that was nor formerly occupied by Rolex. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, right across the street, uh, Timberland recently closed uh, their doors at uh, 625 North Michigan. And I guess sort of in between those two pieces of good and bad news, a sort of a medium-sized bit of, of news, Cartier is leaving a space uh, just next door to that old Rolex space uh, at 630 North Michigan. They're not leaving altogether, though. They're moving to Russian Oak, so they'll be nearby. So a lot of bling moving to Oak Street, but we still have some shimmer and sparkle on the Meg Mile with Swarovski. That's good to know. Uh -huh. All right. There is also a proposal to build the first Chicago area development of homes made from shipping containers. Tell us about this pitch and what is the benefit of building with a shipping container? Well, this is a pitch that's really interesting that's been put up uh, down in Grand Crossing on the south side. Uh, what's interesting about it is the the, the critical mass. They're pr proposing a first phase of a dozen of these houses constructed from shipping containers. Uh, and that with the possible second phase of eight, what's noteworthy about that is that, you know, we've seen construction from shipping containers dotted around the city and the suburbs for years now, but this is really the first big development that's sort of designed around this uh, this construction conceit. Each house will be built out of about five shipping containers. Uh, they'll have three to four bedrooms, 1,800 square feet, uh, and they are going to be starting at 300K, which is about what houses in that neighborhood have gone for recently. Uh, the developers say that this is an opportunity to create more affordable housing on the south side. 
Uh, these uh, shipping container houses are easier to build quickly uh, and they're cheaper to build as well, but they're durable and uh, people who live in them say they love them. They sell like hotcakes in the suburbs and elsewhere in the city. We'll see. Now, just in time for the end of summer, there is a new ice cream treat for adults only. Tell us about the ice cream dive bars. Yeah, treat, I don't know. I, I'll let you decide whether you think this is a treat. Uh, they're, they're hoping, I think, that uh, ice cream infused with Miller High Life beer at 5% alcohol uh, and crumbled peanuts uh, and caramel to resemble that, that evoke that sticky floor feeling of a dive bar uh, and a hint of tobacco smoke flavoring will somehow get people to uh, want to, you know, indulge in that that flavor of a dive bar. I'm not so sure, but Miller High Life is betting on it and they're working with a specialty ice cream company to roll these things out. You can buy them now online. You never know. There's not much I think that chocolate can do wrong, but I will say, Anne, my parents recently got me mustard ice cream. Love Ooh. mustard, but it was, it was a pass. <laughs> Maybe I'll try <laughs> one of these and let you know. Thanks so much for sharing all that news with us. Thank you. It's a story we've been following for the last two years. Vendors anxiously waiting to hear from the company that bought the discount mall in Little Village. Merchants say the mall's contract is set to expire at the end of the month and they haven't heard anything about a renewal in over a year. Chicago Tonight's Joanna Hernandez spoke with some vendors who fear they're losing their businesses. <laughs> It's business as usual inside the discount mall on 26th Street in Little Village. Customers navigating through the aisles as vendors work to get a sale. But these merchants don't know how long they'll have a space to actually run their businesses. They just give us time, okay, give you one month, we give you one year, one give you two years, whatever they be honest with us. Safra Sati has been working at the mall since 1989, but that could soon end by the end of the month. We're told the contract between Novak Construction and the tenant who manages the vendors is set to expire August 31st. Right now, frustration, we don't know if we're going to open the store tomorrow or not. They're going to tell us, okay, they give us one week to take your merchandise and get out from here. Over the course of the year, I've tried multiple times to communicate with Novak Construction, but either a spokesperson tells me they'll get back to me or they don't respond at all. So, si es triste que no den una respuesta. Para saber y, y uno también tratar de, pues tenemos que buscar, la vida tiene que seguir y nosotros tenemos que echarle para adelante. Y si es aquí, mejor. Veronica Gutierrez and her husband have been running an electronic shop for more than 20 years. She says they've basically raised their kids in the mall. Yo le diría que nos dieran la oportunidad de seguir aquí en nuestros negocios, que somos personas trabajadoras, que queremos seguir adelante. Daniel Reynoso is a resident in Little Village and a community activist with Lucha por la Villita. He says he isn't surprised the developer hasn't said a word, but now worries what losing the mall would mean for the neighborhood. Here in Little Village, you have the sale of Discount Mall. You have the proposal for El Paseo bike path. You have the recent acquisition of, of Target with the Hilco. And then you have the Chamber of Commerce uh, corridor rejuvenization of 26th Street. All four of those things are great but they don't provide the protections to keep the people that live here here because unless they provide rent protection, property tax protection, you're not going to be here to enjoy those amenities. Over the last two years, we've interviewed multiple merchants who have echoed concerns about speaking up in fear of losing their booths. One of the things that I've, that I've noticed is that when we speak up, we're told, we'll talk to your alderman, follow, follow the avenues of communication that exist, but if the powers that be, whether they're political or certain community powers, are on the side of the corporation and you're trying to open dialogue with them and they're just not listening, so then what do you do? Alderman George Cardenas represents the area where the discount mall is located. He says the last he's heard, Novak was in negotiations with the subleasers and tells WTTW News it's a private transaction. I would urge all sides to sit down and work it out. With the ward maps being redrawn, the Little Village Plaza will soon be in Alderman Byron Cicho Lopez's ward. He tells us he has plans to visit the plaza. Well, already I reached out to the Department of Planning uh, to learn exactly where, uh, what is the status of, of this development. For us, uh, the local economy and the local vendors are important. Uh, uh, Alderman Cardenas has said that 
he welcomes a good faith negotiation. Uh, he has not provided a, an update or exactly where things are at, but I already made a formal request and I, my intention is to meet uh, with the small vendors. Several vendors say they understand the discount mall is in need of major renovations and are hoping Novak decides to keep out big box stores. I could think of it from a historic point that this this cultural place, this, this hub is going to be gone. But then what I wor really worry about is what's going to happen to all the folks that are here, all the vendors and all the economic opportunity that this place provides once once it's gone. It's been difficult. A lot of the vendors just aren't willing to, to speak up. They aren't willing to share because of, they're afraid of reprisals. They're afraid of reprisals from, from the current owners of the discount mall. But they're also afraid that if if they speak up too much or if they cause too much of a, too much of a wave, that their booth might be closed. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Joanna Hernandez. Alderman Sigjo Lopez tells us he is working on setting up a community meeting soon. Back with more Chicago Tonight right after this. Paralysis, death. The word polio once struck fear in the hearts of parents across the nation. The polio vaccine largely eliminated the disease and is considered one of public health's greatest victories. But health officials in New York recently found the first case of polio in the U.S. in nearly a decade, and it's been located in sewage in New York City and surrounding counties. There's also been an international resurgence. The Jerusalem area suffered a polio outbreak this year, and the virus is also showing up in London wastewater. With COVID and monkeypox already causing concern, should we now be worried about a third viral outbreak? Joining us to share her insights is Dr. Tina Tan, professor of pediatrics and infectious diseases at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Tan is also affiliated with Lurie Children's Hospital. Dr. Tan, thank you for being here with us. Before we talk about the resurgence, remind us the impact polio had on American life uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, especially, on Amer especially uh, with American children. Yes, thank you very much. So. Polio really is an ancient disease that has been around for thousands of years. But, you know, probably one of the um, greatest historic figures who had polio was President Franklin Roosevelt, who basically um, was diagnosed with polio in 1921 and um, was paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life. Um, in the 1950s, we really did have a major resurgence of polio. And between 1950 and 1953, there were almost 120,000 cases of paralytic polio with 6,600 deaths that occurred. Um, so we know that during that time period, a lot of parents were really frightened to let their children um, out to, to play um, during the summertime when polio tended to peak. Uh -huh. So. Yeah. And I was so going to say, of course, really that it, 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 the FDR, I mean, a major part of his story and his legend that, that he was paralyzed from polio later in life and, and throughout pretty much his entire presidency. Um, so the Jonas Salk vaccine is a medical miracle, basically uh, eradicates polio. So what is causing the resurgence right now? So right now we're seeing the resurgence primarily in those populations that are either unimmunized or incompletely immunized, and also in individuals that have immunocompromising conditions. And it's being found in wastewater in New York City and London. Do you know whether it's limited to those municipalities or uh, are, are there places elsewhere around the world like Chicago testing wastewater for polio? I mean, and it's possible that it is in other municipalities, but we do not routinely test our wastewater for polio. So unless we are seeing um, increased cases of flaccid paralysis, which um, is an indication of a polio-like illness, um, we don't normally test the wastewater for polio. And give us a sense of what proportion of those with polio experience those really extreme symptoms up to death? Less than 1% of those individuals that are infected with the polio virus 
um, will develop paralytic polio and the complications associated with it. Still, if there's a large number, that is that one percent is still kind of scary. And unlike uh, COVID and monkeypox, people can be contagious and have no symptoms at all. Is that correct? That is correct. Actually, the vast majority of the cases of people that are infected with polio are asymptomatic. What do we know about the stat? I mean, I remember being a kid and, and getting your polio vaccine was part of going to public school. Do all public schools uh, in the country still mandate the polio vaccine? They do. There is a requirement for them to receive, for children to receive polio vaccine before they go to school. And there, uh, we know that, the, I mean, for years there have been parents that have been anti-vaxxers. They've opposed vaccines for various reasons. What are the exemptions uh, to kids getting the polio vaccine? Well, the exemptions here in Illinois are religious exemptions and then medical exemptions. And when you think about religious exemptions, every single major recognized religion um, recognizes the value of vaccines. Um, primarily, the only, um, I guess, sector of religion that does not are the Christian scientists, but all the other major recognized religions recognize the value of vaccines and they actually encourage their um, members to be vaccinated. And you mentioned that the outbreak is possibly caused by increasing numbers of uh, those that are unvaccinated against polio. Why might there be more folks unvaccinated right now, given, given the mandates that have existed for decades? Well, mandates are one thing, but you know, people really don't like other people telling them what they should be doing. And so we are seeing an increase in the number of individuals that are vaccine hesitant or are outright anti-vaccine. And uh, what about COVID? Uh, perhaps it put off some folks uh, going to the doctor, getting their immunizations. Could that be a cause as well? That has been a major factor that may be fueling some of the outbreak that we're seeing because we know that with COVID, there was a significant decline in routine vaccination rates in every single age group. And to date, we still have not um, been able to catch up to where we were pre-COVID. And that may be contributing to some of the outbreaks that we're seeing. And given the outbreaks you're seeing, again, in places like New York, London, Jerusalem, are you worried about a nationwide or even worldwide outbreak akin to COVID? Um, the vaccines that we have are very, very effective. Um, so if we were to see an outbreak, it would occur in an unvaccinated population, in an undervaccinated population, or in, in individuals that are immune compromised. And how would you advise the CDC or other public health officials to tackle this problem right now? Well, they are addressing it um, by doing wastewater testing and also um, encouraging individuals to be vaccinated, to be up to date on their vaccines or to get a vaccine booster um, with polio vaccine if they don't know if they have received all the vaccines that they should have received. And, and so we know this, the vaccine, again, the Jonas Salk vaccine, which he famously gave away for free, has been enormously uh, successful, but there still is no cure for polio, correct? That is correct. And just remember that the salt vaccine is the oral polio vaccine, which we do not use in this country. We use the injectable vaccine. Ah, okay, that's a very important uh, distinction. And then once you get it as a kid, is it, is it effective for your whole life or do public health officials recommend boosters? So um, once you get four doses, um, I misspoke, I'm sorry. The injectable vaccine is the salt vaccine, which is the only vaccine that we use in this country. The Sabin vaccine is the oral polio vaccine, which is used in other countries outside the U.S. and Canada. Um, and basically, if you get four doses of vaccine, which is what is recommended as a child, you have a 99% um, effectiveness rate for those vaccines. So um, if you are fully vaccinated, you should be protected against polio. So one of the greatest uh, medical breakthroughs uh, of the last uh, 100 years or so. All right. Our thanks to Dr. Tina Tan for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And up next, calls for more Latino political representation. That's in a conversation that first aired on Chicago Tonight Latino Voices with guest host and WBEZ reporter Michael Puente. So please stay with us. Latinos in the state of Indiana represent 8% of the population. That's according to the Indiana Latino Institute. Their findings show that undocumented immigrants contribute nearly $100 million to the state's economy. Yet, when it comes to their representation in the General Assembly, the state has only a single Latino representative. Joining us now to talk about Latino representation, abortion, and other issues affecting the Latino community in Indiana is State Representative Mike Andrade. His district includes Munster, Highland, South Hammond, and North Griffith. Thank you for joining us, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Puente. It's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you. As we just heard, you are the only Hispanic lawmaker in Indiana's General Assembly. How do you think lawmakers like yourself can promote more participation in politics among the Latino community? I believe that we strongly can make a difference when we work together. So I've been heavily involved in my community, especially in the Hispanic community, bringing different stakeholders together. And we are strong in numbers. And so I've been working feverishly to have, uh, you know, education be a priority, healthcare, as we all saw what happened last week with the uh, abortion bill and other topics that affect our Hispanic community by bringing stakeholders together um, and promoting that being a public servant and being a Latino in office is a good thing because representation matters. That's right, that's right. And you talked, you brought up the uh, abortion vote from last week. Uh, we have a clip of you talking on the uh, State House floor. Let's take a listen to that. I believe in a woman's right to have the freedom to make her own decisions. A woman's choice should not be decided by the government but rather by her doctor, family and face, and most importantly, herself. I do not possess the knowledge or the ability or the expertise to make a decision on behalf of 3.4 million women in our Hoosier state. But I will tell you this, I will continue to fight for women's rights and all Hoosiers because that's what they deserve. Now that they actually voted to approve that uh, the uh, new abortion restrictions, and um, how do you think that affects overall Indiana and the Latino community? Well, it's strongly going to affect all of us um, because, as I mentioned, we all have women in our lives that we love, Great. whether it's our spouses, our mothers, uh, teachers, nurses, our neighbors, nieces, and so healthcare is already a big priority in our state, especially in our black and brown communities. In our Hispanic communities, we lack having access to health care. And so this is going to put a more restrictions on our communities, especially in the black and brown communities. Instead of us working forward, we're working backwards. And that's something that I'm going to continue to work uh, with my colleagues downstate to make sure that this next session coming up, that we are making provisions, uh, modifications on that bill uh, to be able to make it more accessible for women to have uh, the right to health care. And that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for women to have the ability to make their own decisions, but most importantly, to have access to health care. Well, Representative, being the only Latino in the state house, is it difficult for you to not only represent your entire community, but you're almost like the lone voice for Latinos in the state house? Tell us about how difficult that can be for you. It's challenging. It's challenging because I'm the only person walking into a room a lot of times, and I'm the only Latino. But you know what? It's also an honor, uh, Mr. Puente. I remember when I got elected in 2020, and I went to the state house with my dad, and I get emotional. My dad came as an immigrant to this country from Mexico, and I remember him working three jobs sometimes so that he could be able to afford for us to have a meal in the table. Not only that, but for him to be able uh, to pay the attorneys, immigration attorneys, so he could get his legal status. So people forget how much our immigrant families come here to work. Not only do they come here to give us a better lifestyle and themselves, but also to be able to afford paying for immigration attorneys, which is very expensive nowadays, and even back then. 
And we're walking into the state house, Mr. Puente, and my dad looked at me and he says, son, we did it. You did it. We have arrived. And I will always remember those words. And that's why it's an honor to be the only Latino, 100% Hispanic Latino in the state house fighting every day for our Latino communities, because it's truly it's an honor. We have arrived. There is there is representation. The worst part about it will be if there was zero representation. That will be the most difficult part. And I know it's challenging, but we're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to advocate. And that it's an honor to serve our Latino communities because si se puede. I truly believe in ese refrán que dice si se puede. Un pueblo unido jamás será vencido. And uh, we're going to continue to fight and we're going to continue to advocate for our community. Well, Representative, what do you see as the needs for the Latino community, not just in your district, but statewide? Well, statewide, one of the biggest things that I've been advocating for, and we're going to bring this up again this next session, is for the uh, undocumented, the immigration community, to be able to have access to driver's license or an ID to be able to drive. Um, so they could be able to commute from their house to their jobs, you know, to be able to pick up their kids at school, be able to have a quality of life just like every one of us who are here in our state. So I've been pushing uh, for that as my neighboring state, Illinois, has already have that for the uh, documented community where they're able to have a driver license or some type of identification to be able to drive. And as, as, as our economic development and our economy grows in our state, the Latino community play a big factor in that. So that's one of the biggest issues. Number two is education. In-state tuition reimbursement is very important for our DACA students and for students who have already applied for legal citizenship, but the process, as we know, on a federal level takes a long time. So allowing them to be able uh, to get institutional reversing just like everybody else is important because education matters. And we wanna make sure that our Latino community are being educated because they contribute to our, econom our economic development and our economic growth in our state. Um, and as we've been talking, healthcare, so those are some of the biggest priorities in our state that I'm pushing for, that I'm looking for next session to continue to have those conversations with my colleagues across the aisle. Well, our thanks to Indiana State Representative Mike Andrade for joining us here on Latino Voices. Thank you. Back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. COVID and monkeypox are just some of the challenges facing the new head of the Illinois Department of Public Health. He joins us for a one-on-one. -on -one. Plus photographing nature and reflecting on 100 years of growth at the Morton Arboretum. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Amanda Vinicky. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and enjoy the beautiful night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm whose attorneys embrace a culture of philanthropy and service by volunteering their time, expertise, and guidance to help others in the greater Chicago community. <laughs>